In the mid-1990s, I walked into Cornton Vale Women's Prison in Scotland. It's near Stirling. It's in the mountains. It's a beautiful place, like so many prisons, like McGabbery here. It's in the country, like McGilligan here. It's in one of the most beautiful areas. What a denial. A denial of the environment, a denial of the location, a denial of the place. I was walking through the prison, and she was behind a cage, in a cage, walking the cage, three prison officers around her, guards. She was prowling. I wanted to know her story. Eight women had died in this prison in the previous three years. I wanted to know her story. They took me to her, in through double gates, down a corridor, either side of the corridor, strip cells. At the end of the corridor, a double door. A double door that opened into another door. A raised corridor that went round from where I was standing. This was a cell within a cell. The outer door was padded. There was absolutely no way the sound from inside could be heard outside. She was in this cell on a concrete plinth. The wall on the inner cell had spy holes. That's where she was observed. She was there because she was ill. She wasn't there because she had committed some dreadful crime. She was there because she was ill. Years ago, I read C. Wright Mills's book, The Sociological Imagination. He talks about turning personal troubles into public issues. Such a simple but such a profound statement. When does a personal trouble become a public issue? In the work I do, it sounds grand. I believe that it is my role as an academic to bear witness. I believe it's my role as an academic to listen to the view from below and record the view from below. I believe that it's part of my role to take those testimonies and challenge the deceit of powerful institutions through those testimonies. That's what I do. I'm just an ordinary person, but that's what I do. That's what underpins everything that I do to take those personal troubles and turn them into public issues. As Stephen Amden said, the whole process is about turning cases into issues. I was in Morn House, McGabbery, and a nun passed me by. And as she walked past, she said, Go to the punishment block now. I went to the punishment block. Linda Moore was with me. We went down. We demanded that Claire, it's not her real name, that her cell was opened. By this time, I'd been in prisons for 20 years. I'd never seen anything quite like this. She was cut from her wrists to her shoulders, from her ankles to her hips. She had a canvas, non-destructible gown wrapped around her. The Velcro had been taken away in case she self-harmed. It was held together with sellotape. She wasn't allowed knickers. She went to the toilet in the corner in a small potty, a child's potty, cardboard potty. She lay on a raised plinth. She wasn't allowed in the day to have a mattress. She had a canvas blanket. That's all she had. I'd asked her permission to go in the cell. I'm a man going into a young woman's cell. Claire was 16 in an adult jail in our time. This is Claire. I was put in the hospital wing for nine days. They brought me over here 
for one night. That night I tried to hang myself and they wouldn't take me back over. I hear the voices and see things. The voices tell me to do them. Self-harm. And I release the pain as well. It's terrible, so it is. You sleep and you keep changing positions and they won't even give me my own clothes in case I did anything stupid. Just look at what they make me go to the toilet in. That's for night time. It's a disgrace. They don't give me underwear or nothing. It's hard. They just give you a wee sanitary towel and that's it. She had to trap it between her legs. Look what they've done to me. That's Claire. In our name, that's Claire. With our taxes, that's Claire. Just a few miles from where we live, that's Claire. Claire with a history of abuse, heroin addiction from 13, put out to men in the family when she was 14. Why was she in? Doesn't matter. But if you really want to know, for threatening herself. For threatening herself. I stayed with her for the rest of that day with, or that afternoon, with Linda. And we never got to see Roseanne. Roseanne, Roseanne Irvine, in prison, for setting fire to her own flat, charged with arson, a danger to herself a danger to no one else. She too has a long history of self-harm. She too had a history of abuse. She too was a wonderful young mother. We didn't get to see Roseanne. I never got to see Roseanne. That night at 10 o'clock, I picked up my email. Roseanne had taken her own life. To this day, I wonder what if. I wonder what if. I gave evidence, as did Linda, at her inquest. This is Roseanne. This is Roseanne in the words of her closest friend who was in prison with her. What happened to Roseanne was frightening. You think you're going to bed safe and you wake up and you ask a warder where someone is and they say she hanged herself. All she wanted was to see her child, but they didn't listen to her. Roseanne's death could have been prevented. The next day, I just sat and cried. Then I had panic attacks. They didn't get the nurse over. I pushed the button and they came to the door. I asked to see the nurse and they just said no. They said, you're not allowed to push the button. It's for emergencies only. I said I was having a panic attack. They said, take deep breaths. It was early evening. I sat on the bed with the pillow close to me. And I cried. And I cried. When we gave evidence at her inquest, the jury refused to believe that she died by her own hand. Of course she did. But what they were saying was foreseeable and it was avoidable. The death of a woman who needed help. And of course, she wasn't the first. Three months after Roseanne took her own life, we gave evidence at the inquest of Annie Kelly. Annie Kelly from Straban, her 28th time in prison. Annie Kelly, a wonderful young woman, a woman who came from a troubled family, who was feisty, who fought back against the system. You don't fight back against the system in prison, as some of you guys in here know. Because if you do, it's a big system, it's a strong system, it's bigger than you. We have Annie's testimony to that. Then they all held me out in the corridor. I had only a suicide dress on and I was told I could keep my pants because I, because I had an ST sanitary towel. But when the men were holding me, they got a woman's screw to pull my pants off. That shouldn't have happened. Then they covered me in sellotape to keep the dress closed and handcuffed me and dragged me off to the male hospital. The male hospital. She's a woman in a male jail. I've hung myself a pile of times. I just rip the dress and make a noose. 
but I'm only doing that because of the way they're treating me. The cell floor is covered in piss because they took the piss pot out the other night. There are flies in the cell. They won't let me clean it. I haven't had a shower now in four days. I've had no mattress or blanket either in the past few nights. At the end of the day, I know if there's anything happens to me, there will be an investigation. An investigation into what? An investigation into her complex health needs, the history of abuse and degradation she'd suffered as a young woman in a patriarchal family, a woman in a male jail, a woman kept in isolation, day after day, 23-hour lockdowns. Oh, yes, happy Christmas. You remember this Christmas, tonight, because those men and women will be locked down for nine consecutive days because the prison will be short-staffed. Human rights. The abuses of human rights. The Human Rights Commission work that we did here in the North Pages, case studies, hours, 96 recommendations, all contested by the Prison Service of Northern Ireland, all absolutely demonstrable, provable, clear, unquestionable. Oh, we'll make the changes. We've moved on. The women are no longer in McGabbery. They're in Hyde Bankwood. Women in a young offender's institution that is a male institution. Their needs secondary to the preeminent needs of the young men who are in that institution. Women who have to be escorted around the campus wherever they go. Imagine this campus out here. Everywhere you go, regardless of whether you're on remand, whatever you, crime you've committed, whatever you've been prosecuted for, you're escorted because you're in a male jail. Every movement watched, judged as a woman, judged as a good woman, as opposed to a bad woman. In the male jail, pornography litters all of the cells, or many of the cells. In the women's jail, not even a photograph of a guy burying his chest. Double standards, totally different ways of operating. Men and women are different. Their needs are different. Not least, their needs around premenstrual tension. Not least, as they get older, going through the change. Not least, the need when they, when they are premenstrual. Not at least, the need to have access to water. Of course, they're different. We've moved on. We've had a prison review. Things have changed. We've learned. We have a new director of prisons. We have governors who are more sensitive. We have man management, who is, which is more sensitive. We have prison officers that are more attuned to the needs of the women. Part of what we do in our analysis is always to expose deceit. We didn't need to expose deceit. Francis, Francis exposed deceit. She gave her life to that deceit. The 4th of May, 2011. Francis McCone, she's not in the gallery. She's in Hyde Bank Wood. Because I suffer from mental problems, my time for thinking is my biggest problem. When I have too much time to think on my hands, that's when my mood lowers severely and I become suicidal. My thoughts make me, my, my mind snap and I just can't cope with it anymore. I self-harm to try and stop it, to block out the thinking. And sometimes I even go far enough to plan a new way to end it all, just to stop my pain from my thoughts. I lose the head and have to put up with being watched, which makes my paranoia worse, and the voices I hear make me go mad. Because of it, I stress out. It's the worst combination of emotions you could possibly imagine. It's so uncontrollable, and even to this day, it scares me every time it happens. Every time it happens, the demons I suffer 
I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It's a living nightmare. I do have good days, but they are few and far between. My life has been engulfed by turmoil and heartache. The health care in here is lethal. They are useless. Don't, don't care about the welfare of inmates. They just do no more than they have to to get through the day. So we rely on ourselves to sort out our own problems. Where was the duty of care? Where was the duty of care for Francis? Where was the foreseeable risk that was run? What about the neglect? She didn't see a psychiatrist for six months after she moved in to the prison, even though she had an established mental illness. If I have one passion around prisons, it's for their abolition. It's for their abolition. We give people the treatment and support that they need. And for those few people who can't manage to live in wider society, call it something else, but don't call it a prison. We know these walls that we're in, they have stories to tell. They have stories like these. For the sake of these women, for the sake of these women, we start abolition with the abolition of women's imprisonment.